are, Kevin. We have been representing people injured as a result of other people's negligence for over 50 years here in South Florida. If you get injured as a result of somebody else's negligence, it can be a car accident, it can be a slip and fall, medical malpractice, negligent security. If somebody else's negligence caused an injury to either you or one of your loved ones, give us a call. Our phone number is on our page, our website is on our page, and our email addresses are on our page. Please give us a call for a free consultation. We'd love to help you. Let Zach and I protect your rights. Hey, it feels incredible. And welcome to this edition of FOF Live presented by Burger and Hicks. As always, you can check out Burger and Hicks on their TikTok and on their Instagram, and you can check them out at their number below. As always, if you've been in trouble with someone else's negligence, please contact Burger and Hicks. As you can see, we have a very special show for you all here today. There's no Eli, there's no Isaac. Noah is MIA and NYC, and we have got the best crew for you to hit. We have two Dannys, two interns, and one Kevin. It is myself, Danny Rodriguez, Kevin Bajal, intern Nick, intern Nate, and of course, the 25 time, I believe, <laughs> champion, Hall of Famer, retired, came back one, retired again, gonna come back and then retire again. Mr. Danny Alvarez of El Extravase. Danny, it's always great to have you on. Um, and it's always great to be here with you guys. Weird not to be uh, playing Jeopardy. Um, <laughs> I when when Kevin sent me the link, I was like, wait, but am I doing like the pregame, sh the pre-series show, or I'm playing Jeopardy? Like for for once, I, I forgot completely what I was doing. But it's great to be here with you guys uh, to talk some baseball, talk some fish. Fighting fish and talk some Yankees as well. Oof. We we do have a lot to talk about. Um, I think we could go. At, we can you know obviously start with the series preview, but I want to go ahead and first talk about the big news that came today, and that is Yuri Perez getting surgery on his elbow for Tommy John. That was the big news for the Marlins over the course of the past week. Um, we'll get into their win in about after that. But Kevin, we'll start with you. Yuri getting Tommy John surgery. It seems like this injury is hitting the Marlins and has been the worst times himself, Max Meyer, Anthony Bander, Sandy, and now Yuri Perez. Um, what's going on there and what do you suspect from Yuri as he now has to begin his rehab process? Yeah, definitely tough, especially, you know, when you first lose Braxton, you first lose Edward Cabrera and, you know, Sandy as well last year. It's, it's definitely a big loss. And I, I guess to a certain extent, it goes to show that even, you know, as much as you want to limit these guys' innings and all that stuff, you know, Yuri was sent down midway through the year. It doesn't really matter. At some point, this is going to happen. And, you know, and I know the, the controversy with the pitch clock is coming out again, but Yuri was used to the pitch clock in the minor leagues. He actually got it before the major leaguers, if we remember. That was implemented into the minor leagues first. So there's a lot of ways that you could have seen Yuri – go back to this Tommy John and I was talking to someone today and they were telling me, you know, this was something that happened. Yuri's arm has been in, in kind of an issue with the Rockies. I knew who's going to sign with them at one point that didn't happen due to an injury, I believe. So, and then Red Sox as well. And then eventually he went to Miami. So a lot of different moving pieces there, but um, wishing Yuri the best. Glad he's getting this out of the way early. You know, he's still just 21. So still super young, still a lot of years left in his career. And, um, you know, hopefully we get him back and uh, better than ever next year. Yeah, I want to go ahead and talk to Danny Alvarez about this. Um, I want to get his thoughts uh, where it seems like it, every star pitcher has been getting through this Tommy John. We have Shane Bieber, Spencer Strider. Looks like he's going to go through that. Now, Sandy, Yuri, it seems like all these pitchers who are throwing multiple innings each start, who are throwing high velocity, are getting Tommy John surgery. I, I want to get your thoughts on maybe this. It seems like this injury bug going around the league as of late. Yeah, it, it's something that that has to to worry a lot of people because we're we're seeing so many valuable players 
that are the main figures of this game going down due to injuries. But this is something that is not new. We've been seeing it as a as, a, <laughs> as, as Justin Verlander called it a pandemic for for years now. If you remember those 2013, 2014 years when Jose Fernandez went down, Matt Harvey. Matt Moore, Tyler Skaggs, and, and all those big names at the moment that get surgery. Uh, Martin Perez as well was, was involved in, in, in a surgery as well. And, and it, it, has to, it, it has to do, I mean, it's, it's a mix of everything. You have to throw the pitch clock in. You have to throw analytics in there. You have to throw the, the level or, or the style of scouting that we have nowadays where you can see kids in high school or college trying to throw 95 plus 96 97 and it doesn't matter uh, sometimes if they if they throw strikes or not and as soon as we see guys trying to to throw this hard to get much more spin on the ball we're gonna see this type of injuries because it's an anti-natural movement of the of the arm of the human body it's not it's not wrong to do it because we've seen that that humans are capable of doing it and we see guys throwing over 100 miles, miles per hour um, but at some point it's going to happen because it's not natural so uh, yes i think it has a lot to do with how kids are being thought when when they're starting to to play little league and as soon as they go like uh, going through different levels uh, high school college minor leagues big leagues and it, it is a problem that it's it's a it's gonna affect i think every single pitcher and at, at some point in their careers and obviously we have to start from i would say the big leagues but it goes from top to bottom and for to see to to not see it that frequently i think it's gonna get uh years to to not having almost every week news about one or two pitchers getting tommy john yeah, now I want to um, go to Nick. How do you feel like this impacts the Marlins long term? Do you think now this is maybe a lost season for the Marlins? Um, you know, with four of their top pitchers now out for multiple months, Sandy Yuri out for up until 2025, um, Edward Bragg seems like a couple months till they're going to be fully back. Do you believe this is maybe a lost season for the Marlins, or is there any way, shape, or form that they can try to build something out of this year? I mean, I don't think you want to exactly call it a lost season already. It's still early. It's still really early in the year, obviously. They haven't started the year like they would have wanted to. But losing so many of your top pitchers right at the start of the year and having them be out for that significant of a time really does make it call into question because the Marlins already didn't have a phenomenal pitching depth going in this year. You weren't going to go out there and go over there pitching with Sandy being out and with you're right now going out right away. It was you weren't you knew there wasn't going to be a fantastic pitching season right off the bat, but now just more guys going out. It makes it hard to imagine them going deep into the year, having to use guys that really necessarily shouldn't be top level starters. Using guys that you're three and four, or two, three, and four, that should be four or five guys. Where it's it that does that's not going to be really sustainable for a whole season. And yeah, you could argue that it could be a lost season, even though it is so early in the year. I think you're muted, Danny. Oh, oh I was going to say, um, last thing on this topic before we head into the little series review from the Cardinals, um, Nate, in your maybe um, opinion, how do you think um, maybe this way should be resolved with all the Tommy John surgeries? And maybe how do you think the Marlins should handle young pitchers now and including, you know, their, their top guys going forward? Yeah, like Danny said, I mean, it's a lot of wear and tear on the arm, obviously, an unnatural movement, but – I think it's definitely like the mechanics that people are being taught nowadays. I mean, I see in high school baseball, especially some of my friends already have Tommy John, other kids have Tommy John this early. And I don't, it did not used to be like that. I mean, at least at this rate uh, amongst high schoolers and college kids. So uh, it's definitely catching up to people. I don't know what exactly is about the mechanics. I see some people talking about the arm being up in the delivery. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, for the Marlins, um, it's hard, hard to, you know, cause you don't really know what the exact pinpoint where it would pinpoint how Tommy John starts. So I believe, you know, just kind of getting better mechanics, I guess, from top to bottom in the organization to limit it. Cause like I also Danny said, it's not just spiking all of a sudden happened in 2013, 14 with a bunch of big name guys. So um, I think it's 
a lot has a lot to do with mechanics, so definitely something to look into. And I think a good example of kind of what happened to Yuri is with Jose Fernandez, not to the same extent where Jose pitched more innings that for that rookie mm-hmm. year, but he didn't last too long. And then he had to undergo Tommy John, and they were pretty lim- You know, Danny, you could probably talk about this a little bit more. They were limiting yeah. him pretty a lot, you know, during that rookie year. Yeah, I mean, they. I, I think Jose pitch. Well, they, they didn't want him to to start the year in the big leagues, but yeah. Sanabia, Evaldi, Anderson, like three or four pitchers went down, and and they had to start Jose um, from from the starting rotation week one of the season. And then they in, in September they shut him down, and at some some games they did not let him go six or seven or eight innings. Uh, so it, it it happens, and you and you can. Protect pitchers as much as you want. We saw it with Eudi. We, I mean, not 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 to, with Sandy because with Sandy we, we saw that they let him pitch as many innings as he wanted. But you have the two the, the two poles here. One guy that pitched a thousand innings. One guy that pitched five or six per game. They both ended up having Tommy John because again, it's 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 not natural. And the more you try to um, the more you try to find that that uh, that velocity and and that spin, it's gonna happen. So yeah, there's something there, there's something Verlander mentioned on that um, interview yesterday when he pitched for for the Sugarland team, uh, the AAA for for the Astros, that he said that he changed his his approach in 2016 or beginning in 2016 and 17 when he got traded to Houston, when he saw how. Uh, you know, when, when they had like the juice ball and everyone was hitting home runs and opposite field home runs and um, things happened that you were like, how, how is this player getting 38 home runs? Like, like we see a guy like uh, Eduardo Escobar from the Diamondbacks that year, he hit 38 in 2019. Or Glaber Torres almost hit 40. Or guy with no power, Mickey Rowe hit 11 in 2018. And you were like, okay, Good for them, but this it, this is happening, and and it's weird to see. And Verlander said, "I had to change my approach to more swing and miss." And obviously, you're trying to find more velo, more spin, so they can chase, and they, those bats miss miss the miss the baseball. And that when when that changed back again a couple of years ago, and you add that they don't have the, they don't have the sticky stuff anymore. Obviously, it changes for everybody. It's not fair because it's not the same for a long period of time. It's it's it changes from year to year, and obviously, that's going to hurt the body as well. Yeah. Now we can, I want to get um, Isaac's and Alex's opinion on this. Um, what I mean by Isaac, I actually want to hear Bella's opinion on. Um... <laughs> no, but honestly, what's been your opinion on the recent surge of Tommy John surgeries? We were just talking about this. Now, now Yuri getting it today. You have Shane Bieber, Spencer Strider. The list goes on and on in terms of names getting Tommy John. Just what's your overall aspect? This has just been the biggest news of baseball, it seems like, to start the year. Yeah, I'm frustrated that Danny beat me to it. He he laid it out perfectly with how, you know, Jose was treated back in 2013. He wasn't even supposed to make that opening day rotation, but because of his e- voice e- and- Even when we're not playing Jeopardy, I'm still beating you. <laughs> I, 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 through it. I was a little bit tardy, but Henderson and Evaldi in the last week of spring training, both get hurt. I think both shoulder injuries and Jose had to be forced to be in that opening day rotation. And they, they treated him just as just as carefully, if not more carefully, than they treated Yuri this past year. And he still got Tommy John the next year, early the next year. I remember he had that start against San Diego where he just shit the bed and and it was clear that he needed Tommy John. Mm-hmm. And regarding just all around Major League Baseball, you got to assume the pitch clock has something to do with it. I don't. I think that these phenomenal world-class athletes are able to avoid these type of things when given a 20-second pitch limit. In between pitches, I'm sorry. So it's just I don't know what to pinpoint. It's been a it's been an epidemic in Major League Baseball forever. One out of every three Major League pitchers in history has undergone the surgery. So you just can't say all of a sudden this is happening. It's been happening forever. That, that's 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 the thing that you you cannot say. And 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 this is what uh, from the the statement from from the from the union from, right. from Tony Clark when he pinpoints the the clock automatically. It's like Tony. Like you know, like during your days, it pitchers had Tommy John with no. Yeah. The thing is that we and we have to take this into the, into the discussion. Whenever you talk about something of the union, 
and the, and the league it's is that cute. we know we know that whatever the union says that the league doesn't like, they're going to refute it, and it's going to be the same the same way around. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's it's going to be the same whenever the league said something, and the union is going to be like, no, we don't like that, we uh, we reject that, and it's going to be the same thing on the other on the other uh, side. And we obviously saw what happened twenty twenty one with the with, with the lockout and twenty twenty two and twenty twenty with the um, negotiation that the season started, um, you know, very late and it could have started earlier. And that's something that we, we have to consider as well. It's not that it's not that magically all oh, the pitch clock happened and boom, right. pitch had Tommy Jane. Because in twenty fourteen we had we, the record is still from that year. There was no pitch clock at any level in baseball. Dude, I, still, I know you're beating me, not even in Jeopardy, bro, but you, you beat me to it again. This stat that I gave out, one out of every three pitchers, that was that was accurate about 15 years ago in 2010 when JJ was undergoing his third Tommy John. It's been a thing. And, yeah, I, I'm sure the pitch clock does not help that cause, but, dude, this has been an epidemic for the last two decades, I would say. So it's just a shame that it's happened to some of the most prominent names in Major League Baseball, in Shane Bieber, in Yuri Perez, in Sandy Alcantara. And the reason I would say, okay, wow, People have an argument for the pitch clock being the reason is because Sandy Alcantara underwent it. And that guy was the biggest workhorse in Major League Baseball that I've ever seen. 200 innings every single year, including 2019 when he threw 197.2 innings, I think he threw. Obviously, 2020 was a, a different story. But the fact that Sandy Alcantara got hurt, that's when I was like, shit, maybe the pitch clock is a thing. But no, like Danny said, it's really just not the case. This has been going on for the last two and a half decades and it's just a shame that, especially if you're a Marlins fan, like most of the people listening are, it's Yuri and it's Sandy. Hazel Zuzardo underwent it. Braxton Garrett underwent it. So many pitchers in this staff have undergone this surgery. And it's a, but it's a Luzardo, shame. Luzardo, I think Luzardo was in high school when he got it, right? Right. Luzardo was in high school. I, Strider, was, Strider was, a, was a college pitcher when he got it. Right. Braxton got it. And then someone else in this organization also got it. But it's... Like Jose was just the biggest thing ever in 2013. He didn't, he threw 167 innings off the top of my head around there. They treated him like a baby worse than Yuri Perez. And still in May of 2014, he still got hurt. And it's just crazy. There's nothing you can do to avoid it. So that's why I think like, I think they should have done with Yuri last year. If he's going, let him go. He's going to go. He's going to undergo it. Eventually. There's nothing you can do. It's inevitable. So let him do it. He gets hurt. He gets hurt. It's going to happen. There's nothing you can do to change that. Um, I would love to keep talking about this topic, but we still have to talk about the Marlins getting their first win of the season um, against the Cardinals. Take Cardinals do take two out of three, but the Marlins did get their first win of the season. Um, we could always talk about the losses, but let's talk about the win. Let's talk about something we have not done before. The Marlins taking that win yesterday. Um, I want to talk to Alex. Max Meyer, finally, we had a pitcher, a pitcher the Marlins had, go through six innings and it took all the way to the 10th game of the year for that to happen. Alex, what did you see from Max Meyer? And do you think this can be continuously for him to start the season? No, what I saw from Max Meyer was just the ability to not mess around and just attack hitters and, and uh, get a couple of shutdown innings to start the game. I think that's what was important for them. It wasn't just that they put up six runs in the first inning. It was that Max Meyer then comes back. Goes one, two, three, uh, one, two, three in the first, gets a few shutdown innings, and it just felt the entire way like the Marlins were in control as long as the Max was on the mound. Um, I was impressed with the fact that, really, like we've seen from him throughout his whole career, only two of his pitches were really working. It was just the slider and the fastball, and he's just so good with both of those pitches, especially the slider, that at least for now, he's able to get away with it. Um, yeah, I really liked what I saw from the entire team yesterday. It was, uh, a three-phase win. Uh, the offense looked great. Pretty much everyone uh, looked great uh, in the lineup, except for the catcher position, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Uh, pitching looked great. Uh, not just Max Meyer, but Nardi looked like his old self again. And then even the defense looked good. Uh, Vidal Bruhan had that uh, diving play out in, uh, was it uh, left field, center field? Uh, but the defense looked great too. So just all around great win for them yesterday. I think it was great as a uh, confidence builder. Yeah, and we saw the bats flying, especially in that first inning, um, getting six runs. Jazz looked great. Nick Gordon um, getting a home run. Nick, what did you see the Marlins offensively? We could go pitching-wise and keep talking about Max Meyer, but offensively they really put the Marlins through and gave a comfortable lead to Max just for him to do his thing. 
Yeah, so that first inning for the Marlins was just absolutely fantastic. And going on on Nick Gordon especially, I love Nick Gordon's at bat. Mm-hmm. I watched it a couple times where mm-hmm. he had a really, really good at bat on that home run. He took a curveball up and away for a strike, which questionable was it a strike or not, but then took ball two. It was like just outside the zone on a fastball. It was inside on him. And then he smoked one down the line like a sweeper, drilled down the line, it was 100 off the bat, just fell, and then the one-two curveball hit for a home run. So his at bat there to just keep that inning going and get a bit – just put it out to a big lead early in that game I think was huge and obviously helped them win that game in the end. And Jazz's home run right off the top was really good on a pitch that was really inside. The Marlins kind of killed Kyle Gibson inside. That was a big part of it. He was throwing a lot of inside pitches that they were able to hit. Well, Whether it was righties, he was throwing outside, and lefties, he was throwing inside. And the Marlins were really able to capitalize on all that and get some nice hits and really get that first inning rally going, which – led to them ultimately getting the win. And it was just nice to see also Luis Arise too, go in there, have a big day for him, which if the Marlins are really going to get some more wins, he's going to have to knock a lot more pitches into the outfit like he did last year. He's had a tough start to the year in his terms, so he's going to really have to hopefully get up. And, yeah, that was that curveball, that one-two right right low and in. The pitch before that that he hit was a sweeper right in that same kind of area, just a little bit higher. So he was able to just rally off those two pitches and get a nice, just nice home run. He's been good so far. I think he's had those two home runs so far. So he's been doing good with them. And I think what's really stood out with Nick Gordon, especially, is those two home runs have kind of been no doubters. You know, it's the second he hits them, they're gone. We saw the one on in that final Sunday game against the Pirates where he tied it up, and then this one today, you know. And we're, obviously, we're not going to compare him all, you know, too much to D. Gordon. But, you know, there is one thing. <laughs> it's that this guy definitely hits no doubters, and he's definitely been taking, you know, those gap-to-gap, uh, hits you know pretty well so and then obviously the defense I mean he's looked pretty good defensively you know when you have some guys who who haven't stepped you know not stepped it up but have struggled on that area of, of the game so definitely you know the Nick Gordon acquisitions look good and especially in the moments he's come in he came in a couple times during the um I know that pirate first home run was in, in you know a pinch hit spot so definitely he's been good in those moments as well yeah a game tying home run against David Bednar the ninth inning for Gordon. I, I wish I had more nice things to say about that win, guys, but it was a great first inning. Like Nick said, it was a hell of a first inning. Nick Gordon, great at bat, like you said, and Jazz, big three-run shot. But the rest of that game, the Cardinals won. Like the rest of that game, the Cardinals had it. They had some good at-bats against Kyle Gibson early on, but after that, they let Kyle Gibson dial in and be really, really good and effective. It was great to see Andrew Nardi have a clean inning. It was great to see George Soriano have a clean inning, but – the rest of that game was not pretty. The offense was not good after that first inning. And the pitching obviously was fantastic. That'll give them that. But Matt Andres gave up a couple runs in the ninth after the rain delay. But, you know, the offense leaves something to be desired after that first. Because any if the score was different, I think the other team comes back and wins, comes back to win it. So it was, yeah, it was still a little bit pessimistic regarding this offense. Yeah, but you have to give credit to what obviously what they did at the end uh, to be able to to be able to put those runs um, of to extend, ex, extend extend that lead um, yeah. in the seven and, and the eighth inning because that's what gives you room. Yeah, and and, yeah. When, and and when Andres comes in the ninth inning, obviously you want to clean in and out of that. Uh, you you don't get it, but still in a game that it's ten to one, right? It's it's hard to evaluate if it's a it's if it's like one two three inning. And it's hard to evaluate if it, if it has the outcome that that had this weekend. So right. um, it, overall, I think I think that, that obviously the win is what it matters. Um, mm-hmm. It maybe like I, I kind of agree with Isaac that it wasn't the, the prettiest, but you take you take you take a ten or three win every single night if you if you yeah. can. And and the thing with, with uh, exactly you needed that and 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 hopefully this is this is just the, the start of. Uh, yeah. I'm not not sure if, if a winning streak, but at least to win more games and and, and, and win a couple right. series. With a rise, I see that. Uh, that yeah. like I see now that Luis finally had his first uh, four heat game. It's not that he needed a four heat game, but he looked more like the yeah. rise we've we've seen from, from the last two years, and that's something you want to see. And now um, that gives him more. I I won't, wouldn't say confidence because. I think he's the most confident guy on the team after Jazz, of course. Uh, yeah. But that takes pressure off him, uh, no doubt. And and we saw, and, and this is a discussion that's been going on since the since the arbitration case that people were saying, oh, he didn't 
um, driving any any runs. I'm like, well, see who the, who the seven, eight, and nine hitters are in the finals. But also, it's like he scored three times after. Right. Run, who do so, you? Right. Yeah. Who do you yeah. want him to drive in? And yeah, exactly. and I with a rise. Thank goodness for a game. Gracias a Dios. He really needed that four hit game because poor guy. He was just chasing the high fastball. I think that's his kryptonite when he's not on. He's trying to overcompensate a little bit. He's just such a smart hitter. He, that he chases it, and then when they throw him the the changeup low and away, that's where he's. He probably spoke about this in in, in Spanish during spring training with with us. And he said, yeah. if, and he, he basically said it for the pitchers out there, the changeup kills me. That's what kills me. So when the, when they throw him that, we've seen it swinging and missing way too much at the beginning of the year compared to what it was in 23. Yeah, no, he's at, I think, seven strikeouts now. And it took him until late April, April 27th, to reach seven strikeouts last year. But I think now is when you're going to see a little bit of more balance when it comes to his strikeout numbers. I, I think you'll. You'll see a different rise, especially in Yankee Stadium. I, I'm going to go out in a, on a limb and say he hits his first home run of the season this series. And the one thing I really – and just going back to Max, the one thing that really I, I liked a lot was not relying – not going too much to the changeup. And I know he was very confident and he feels really good about it. But, you know, having the ability to just use that fastball-slider combo really worked out well for him. Um, not sure if he got a strikeout on that changeup. It, you know, he only threw it seven times, you know, given. So – it, that's something I really liked, and I think that's what made his start really, really just arguably the best start for any starting pitcher for the Marlins this season. And you know, the slider was phenomenal, and Skip mentioned it too post game. That's that's the one thing that really needs to be known. You know, Max Meyer's slider is more than legit; it's really damn good, and it's worked out well for him. So yeah, just, just and, overall, really quickly, we can go ahead and talk about those first two games as well. Um, that first run with Ryan Weathers, and when we have that second game with um, Trevor Rogers. Um, very quickly before we get into our press box report and we get into our break, um, just to the panel, what did you guys see for those first two games? What were your main takeaways, really quickly, on that first two of the Cardinal series? Yeah, the Cardinal series, the Ryan Weathers and the Trevor Rogers game, the one with Sixto and. Yeah, I think the first game just sort of resembled what the Marlins have been doing the first homestand that they had, scoring runs early and just completely unable to hold those leads that bullpen. I I don't know about you guys, but I would be extremely worried about Andrew Nardi. His velocity is nowhere near where it was last year. And you just, I mean, they have no one else, but you just can't trust him right now in a high leverage situation. They had a, a pretty, pretty healthy lead going into that um, series opener, but obviously couldn't hold it. The second game was out of reach right when it started. But you, you got to be worried, man. You you got to like the offense a little bit. Like you said, the six-run first inning, they've had big first innings in the Angels series and the Pirates series. They've gone off the fast starts offensively. And then it's just you don't think that they can hold those leads. And then when they don't come out in front first, you just think they can't come back. So it's just not a really good recipe for success so far. But hopefully things change. The change of scenery can do, make all the difference in the world. Yeah, and then it goes to show that, you know, sometimes defense has hurt this team. We saw that, you know, with that sixth inning, That's your eyes play, and then the Burger one. Burger, you know, mm -hmm. avoided extra bases, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's happening with some rise right. this year specifically. And, you know, he was really good defensively last year. I mean, you know, not not gold glove, but he was close. And I, I thought he, you know, I thought he was going to be just as good, and unfortunately just hasn't been the case. But, you know, it's still early, so I'll give him – I guess you could give him a break there. But sixth, so, you know, that, that really hurt him, and – it's it's been a struggle for six at the major league level, despite you know the great spring training. In every start he's made or every appearance he's made, it's been he's given up a run or he hasn't recorded a single strikeout yet at all. So yeah, you know definitely tough. But I think Isaac said it best. You know they're getting off to these great starts, and that's why I feel sometimes the record doesn't show really yeah. what this team could yeah. do because they're really good offensively at times. We have Bell and Berger there who've gone off to pretty good starts, especially Berger and. There's reason to think that, you know, once the bullpen kind of sh sharpens up, they'll it, this team will kind of look a lot better. Yeah, it doesn't show it, but at the same time, that's what makes teams good, you know, to be able to to keep those leads and and, and to add more on and, and, and be able to, to come back. Something that we saw a lot from this team last year, yeah. which is not very different. Uh, obviously, new names, uh, players that didn't come back, like Soler, we know what happened there. Um, but... You, you feel like there's 
I mean that that you can you have that they have the ability to 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 look more than how they look in, in 23 compared to this one. Now I think with more speed, maybe this lineup can be more dynamic, and that's where Skip can can you know play with with those resources or tools that he has that he that he did last year. I think that one of the teams that led the league in hit and run was the Marlins, so yeah. um, they they can do this way too many times and in, in 24. And I yeah. think I'll take a positive kind of side of I think that lat or the second game. I'll just the add one more thing about the ball game. You got it. Or what were we saying about the second game with Trevor Rogers pitching? They actually had some good pitching that game. This is back to back games where they pitched yeah. relatively well. That was a good pitching game. The bullpen came in good. Hoeing had his one good inning where that one was you were unsure of is he gonna be a longer kind of guy now or a short term kind of guy so we'll see what that looks like in his next outing and the hitting wasn't good but also everyone except Fortes and Berger had to hit that game so it was kind of just an unfortunate thing of you lost 3-1 you almost should have had more runs and should have gave up less because Trevor Rogers threw the one away on the pickoff move so that should yeah. be another one that didn't score so that yeah. one almost was closer than it seemed like yeah yeah that's yeah. a good point that is a good point I didn't realize how many eight hits that day um, with Trevor Rogers on the mound and Brian Hoeing, I think he's just so um, versatile because he can be that long man who eats up a nine-one lead or nine-one deficit and just pitches four innings, and he can also be a pretty good seventh inning guy who throws ninety-six mile an hour bowling balls to right-handed hitters and gets outs in pretty high leverage spots. So I think Hoeing is pretty valuable for the team, and there's a reason he made the opening day roster. Um, I think with that is a great time to go into break. Um, Kevin, I know you have flip fish. Um, for but uh, we'll do that, and then after this break, we're going to a series preview, and we'll ha- hear from the Eclipse expert, Mr. Noah Berger, at Yankee Stadium. So, Evan, go ahead with the flip fish. Right, we don't have a, so, he's right here. without Eli. We don't have an actual flip fish, so we're just gonna go one by one, and everyone mentions the most obscure one you could think over the best one. So we'll okay. start with Isaac, and then we'll go down Nick, Danny, uh, Nate, and we'll. Finish it up with Danny and I. Daniel. Okay, for for obscure, I'm gonna go with Nick Johnson, the left-handed mm. first baseman. Very brief Marlin tenure and a little bit of a big Yankees uh, tenure. And then for biggest one, I don't want to take uh, Danny's guy. Let's go with. <laughs> did Andrew Heaney play for the Yankees a little bit? He yeah, did. Okay. He did, and he's really obscure for them. That's an obscure Yankee. So let's go with Andrew Heaney. Uh, I think 14th overall pick for Miami at some point. Let's go with Andrew. I'll go. I'll go really outside the box with mine. Someone I don't know that many guys have heard for. I think he's playing today. I'm gonna go Giancarlo Stanton. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, like uh, Giancarlo. Giancarlo hasn't homer against the Marlins yet. Oh wow. no! I'm <laughs> sorry for saying this. Uh oh. But he hasn't I, homer. I thought he against... homered in 2018. He did it. No, he did. He he hit one off the wall. Like he hit one off the wall. Two there was, or something. Yeah, it was a yeah, line no. drive. He's gonna hit one out. Yeah, he's probably. gonna hit one out. Yeah, I have to say, I'm sorry. When Giancarlo hits it, please. I mean, you can tweet at me. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we're saying obscure, I think I'll have to go with Gary jo- Gary Jones. Oh, okay. Uh, but from that same trade, not obscure. Mi capitán Martin Prado. I know. I succeeded, it, but <laughs> here. <laughs> All righty, uh, If we're going obscure, I'd say Rob Brantley. Uh, was on those 2014. Oh, wow. What? What? <laughs> wow. I, I, just, I just checked his baseball reference. Apparently, he played with the Yankees in 2021 and 2022. I didn't even – I did. thought he was out of the lead way before that. But uh, if we're going guys that had an impact, uh, sneaky Yankee, uh, Derek Cooper. Ooh. I like it. Um, for mine, my big name, I'm going to go with Mr. Nathan Eovoldi. Um That same trade. Same trade. Uh, doing great things now in Texas. Um, and then my obscure one, I'm going to go with Isaac's boy, Hector Noesi. That's a real one. That's a real one. He's probably the worst person I've been around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, not, not, like not saying – like. Uh, baseball wise, which is which says a lot, um, like human, you know, 
I think his name not... comes up in the fish on first group chat at least once every few days. At least. No, it's it's at like least. you know when you know when they say, Oh, he's a better person than player, like that you you hope that that's the, the reality. Uh, I cannot say this about I mean he, he was bad as a player, he was bad as a person. I mean, I cannot say uh, good things. All righty, so I will wrap it up. Uh, I don't know how obscure it is, but Jonathan Davis once in a while was a New York Yankee. What? So that does count. And, uh, you know, Impact, Starlin Castro at one point. Yeah, oh, he was, he, hold he up. was in that, in that Giancarlo trade. So I got you. We're going to bring him up. I got him real quickly. Oh, God. No, there we go. He's a great Yankee, man. <laughs> mi hermano, mi pana careburro. <laughs> he was a hell of a Yankee. Right. He was a he was a Yankee All Star in 2017 in Miami. He was their best. He was their best hitter. Mm-hmm. Well, Judge was their best hitter, but he like, <laughs> he, he, like, he was there. Uh, After Judge, but yeah, um, well, we we get yeah. Go ahead, Danny. No, no. Uh, hold those thoughts. We'll we'll talk more about Starling Castro and how much we don't like Hector Noesi. No, I, I I meant like like more. I mean, we, you can say Richard Blyer. Yeah, uh, you can say Sergio Mitre. Speaking of obscure people, um, um, Andy Fox. See, when you say guys who make impact, do, do I have to bring up David Robertson? Is that an impact guy? Yeah, well, he definitely <laughs> made an. He's, he's, he's awesome. definitely making an impact in 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 the in the Mets uh, farm system, like Ronald Hernandez and Marco Vargas. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's yeah. The, that's the name. Ichiro, Ichiro. Yeah, Ichiro. Donovan Solano. Ooh. Casey McGee. Chichi Gonzalez. Casey McGee. Remember the hard throwing reliever Venezuelan um Henry Rodriguez. In ah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Henry. Um, you know, Andrew Miller was a star with the Yankees. Oh, Andrew I'm Miller was a hell of a Yankee. We have um who else? Randy Choate. Randy if Joe. you guys if you guys take any longer uh, it, to not say John Birdie, I, I, honestly, on his behalf, but, I'm insulted. Like, but we saw him like t- two days ago uh, <laughs> when when he got traded. So yeah, all right, Dan. All right, let's let's go to break and then we'll reintroduce Noah, um, who's gonna give his eclipse. Review. Rick Brignac. <laughs> <laughs> We have been representing people injured as a result of other people's negligence for over 50 years here in South Florida. If you get injured as a result of somebody else's negligence, it can be a car accident, it can be a slip and fall, medical malpractice, negligence security. If somebody else's negligence caused an injury to either you or one of your loved ones, give us a call. Our phone number is on our page, our website is on our page, and our email addresses are on our page. Please. Give us a call for a free consultation. We'd love to help you. Let Zach and I protect your rights. You can check out Burger and Hicks on their website. Call their phone number below, Instagram and Twitter. And, of course, we have to bring in Mr. Burger himself, straight from the Bronx, straight from the Eclipse, and, as always, with the best hat game in baseball. Yeah, that's what I was planning to do with the glasses originally, but I didn't because you guys were insane, John Birdie. So I had to butt in and do that. Um, hi, everybody. How are you? How's we're everyone? Well. Everything is great. Yeah. It's a nice chilly day here. It's it's a it's a Dade versus Broward pitching matchup. You got uh, Jesus Lazardo versus Nestor, Nestor Cortez. You got Hialeah being represented in uh, Parkland on on the bump for the Marlins. Um, it was really funny watching all the guys come after the eclipse. Tanner Scott was continuously trying to convince everyone to look the other way, um, and then putting his hand in front of people's face so that they thought their glasses weren't working. Um, yeah. And uh, there were a couple guys that came out of out of the dugout, looked straight up without the glasses, and we're all like, "Dude, rule number one." Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun seeing all the guys out on the field. I, I got to catch up with John Birdie. Uh, I'm going to record a flip fish thing with him tomorrow. Um, he said he was at a CVS this morning and ran into Tanner Scott, and Tanner couldn't recognize him without his beard. Um, <laughs> I couldn't recognize him without his beard. He's more, he looks more aerodynamic, but he does not look like John Birdie. Um, it'll be exciting to see him play. Uh, the Marlins are wearing their, their alternate blacks today. 
Oh, um, nice. Talk to us about the injury news. We got the year Perez news that was a little scrunched up towards the bottom of a um, of the in, of the news there. But talk to us about Yuri. How's the clubhouse feeling now, knowing that he's not going to be there, not going to be pitching? Just how are the vibes and overall what you heard so far about him going down? Well, they they, they I I tweeted it in the order that it was said, so it was a uh, that's why it's the fifth thing on the list. Um, talk about burying the lead. My apologies. Um, I think the most significant thing there is, yeah, well, yeah, we all knew he was going to have the surgery today. You're happy it went well. You'd be shocked if it didn't go well. Um, and yeah, it's just another blow that I just the team just doesn't really can't really afford right now. Um, I see the comment down there. Anything on Jazz? I can need to talk to Jazz today. He's out of the line. This is a scheduled day off for him. Skip basically said we're facing a bunch of lefties. You get to choose which one you don't want to face, and he chose Nestor Cortez. Um, so, uh, okay, that's the so Jazz had the day off today. He also just. Skip said it's just better to, to not have a play after running in the wall yesterday. But he's available off the bench and his full in his foot was feeling good after after taking PP in the cage today. So he's all right. Um nothing to worry about with him, thankfully. Um anything else that has stood out to you on that injury report? Not really. It's just that, that it's shame for Xavier Edwards that it keeps getting those setbacks and that infection. Um, Josh Simpson throwing an inning. I'm, I'm happy to see that. I'm hoping he's ready to go. He gets to make his debut soon. Um, he's just one of those guys that I just, I just root for no matter what. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to be in the Bronx. It's a, it's really cool being at Yankee Stadium. Um, the press box is beautiful. It's just, everything this is awesome anything um, that skip said that stood out to you today obviously i assume you spoke about yuri but aside from that uh no not really much um anything else you got for us then um i, was, I believe oh, i was going to ask noah just how are the vibes in the clubhouse have you talked to the guys about them finally getting the monkey off their back and getting the first win how are they looking at how are they looking at this series now where they finally have a win and don't have to worry about when are they going to get the next one? The, re- the relief is palpable. They, they just had to get it done. Um, and they finally figured out a way to get it done. Now you now you're, you can focus on the rest of the season. You got your first win. Now you move. Um, of course, you want more wins this week. And you, you never know. They could, they could let the good times roll and sweep the Yankees. I don't think that's a chance ever going to happen. Um, but you never know. Baseball is is a funny sport. Anything can happen. Um, but yeah, a lot of everyone was just very. It was it was a huge relief to finally get that win and play a full nine innings and and, and just not end up blowing the game again. Yeah. Any last thoughts, Noah? While you're there, um, how does John Carlos Stanton look? And what what I do you not prepared? Glorious. How else? <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Astonishing. Glorious. Handsome. I, strong. I, for sure. I, I still remember. I still, still remember crying the day he was traded. Jeez. Okay. Have you gone to Monument Park? You were crying. Whatever it's called. I have not gone to Monument Park. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on today. I'm going to try and get around to see all the sites tomorrow. Um, after I talk to John Birdie, um, mm. I got to figure out a way to find to find kosher food. So I'm, I've heard there's a lot in this ballpark, yeah, and I, I've got to find Eli been. here somewhere. I've got to figure out where in the world he's hiding. Eli and Eli, Eli and, and uh, Father Eli are there too. So Good. Yeah. oh really? Papa Eli is there. Another another Papa, too. Papa Eli. That's, that's a little spoiler for everybody no, there. Noah, Noah, I'll Venmo you a thousand dollars if you go have the ninety nine Judge Burger. <laughs> no. A thousand dollars? You wouldn't it's do not- it? So, you don't want to bet no a thousand dollars like to do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you guys can follow uh, Train Boy Media, No Burger Media, uh, on his Twitter. Train Boy Media. <laughs> That's, That's your next Train account. Boy That's Media. Your next account. That's gonna be That's your my next board. account. Oh, uh, but as always, you can uh, follow Noah on Twitter. 
fish on first. We'll also have some retweets, some stats. Oh, hold on. What, what did Nick Gordon say about the the, the clips? Oh, you yeah. know what, if you want to know what Nick Gordon said, you can read Jordan's article that's coming out later. Huh? Why oh, do we no, have you no, here? No, no, Why no, do we have you here? That's why we have to get the traje. Yeah, I was, I was, I was hoping, I was hoping when he first came out, he'd say, "Oh, it does exist," but he did not. Um, what are he you said it very, not Oh, here's it. the quote: "Anytime stuff like that happens, it's pretty awesome. That's a phenomenon. It was pretty sweet." Oh, so he's it? What an idiot! That's I, that's 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 political. We we all know that's, that's not what he thinks. Bigger, that's yeah. political, Nick. Like, I'm sorry, that's oh, political. No, apparently. We're going to have you head out. We have some more topics to discuss, and we still have not even got into the lineups yet. So, as always, Noah, thank you, and uh, everyone go. Da right. Danny, you, Danny, you're probably closer with him than I am, but does Luzardo actually think that the that we didn't land on the moon? Or is that just uh, I, no, I, I haven't um, talked to him about I, I think he's a very <laughs> well-studied guy well, from very, very smart and well-studied parents. That's what I thought. So maybe, I don't know, but I haven't spoken to him about it. So. Um, that's, not, what, that's what I thought, up. Danny. But when he's telling me that space isn't real and that we didn't land on the moon, I'm like, mierda, bro, this team, we need Sandy back. <laughs> like, I'm going to follow up. <laughs> what does Sandy has to do with because, bro, we need, at, least Sandy thinks, at least Sandy knows we landed on the moon, bro. Okay, does he know that? I don't, you know what? I don't know, but at least he doesn't say that. He doesn't Look, man. That's all right. Okay, okay. This, that that could be was, a topic so. for another discussion, but really quickly, this could probably be a reason why this guy it might not be here next year, and that is Skip Schumacher <laughs> and the Marlins oh. avoiding a contract for his club option in 2025. This could be another version of Isaac flipped fish for Marlins and Yankees with Scoop, Skip Schumacher. Um, but with him, 2025 voided club option. What do you guys think is Skip, if this is last year as the Marlins manager, or do you guys believe it is just another way for them to get an extension towards Mr. Schumacher? Uh, the, the thing is that when when you I, – I mean, we don't know the details of what was discussed during mm -hmm. uh, during that process because the with the option being voided, it doesn't mean that uh, he's not going to come back in 2025. It just means that he is not secured for that year. Uh, but we don't know what's going to happen. Now, seeing how the front office uh, is shaped with all the, the the hirings from Peter Bendix, I wouldn't be surprised if they go all the way around and they bring. I mean, and Peter brings a guy that that he wants, maybe or, or he. I'm not saying they don't get along or anything like that, but maybe he gets along better. Maybe someone he knows from his race day or uh, someone. Maybe someone, uh, somebody that is suggested by any other uh, front office member. So um, it's it's very interesting. I think the timing could could not have been worse because when you're in the middle of a nine game losing streak, and this report comes out, uh, it's outside noise that you don't want around your team. Like we know players really like uh, Skip Schumacher. We know that he they got they all. But into his message from day one last year, there's a reason why this guy won manager of the year and why is he so well respected league wide. And I have no doubt in my mind that if he leaves next year, it's not going to take him long to find a new job as a manager or as a front office member or as a bench coach again, um, because he's a brilliant baseball mind. So um, it's, it's obviously it's not the right timing. We still have to see. Uh, what happens because again it's just week three of the season i guess i'll ask you danny does it surprise you that this because according to what bob nightingale posted it, this was done during the winter does it surprise yeah. you that early no it doesn't surprise me because it was a change like 180 degree change in the in the front office so may, maybe it, i mean if they had a deadline like we know it happens for for example uh with mattingly when it happened in 2021 they had a deadline at the middle of the 2021 season where they had, where they mutually had to agree on uh, exercising that option or, or not. And Mattingly wanted that Kim, Kim Ang and the front office, they wanted that and they agreed on it. Uh, and, and that's why Donnie managed in 2022. I don't know the details of this contract. If, if that happened during 20, during, during the off season, and that was the deadline to 
exercise an option for 2025? I think I get it because they both want, maybe both parts want to see a what's going to happen, especially the front the, the front office because Skip, like he already knows the group, the city, the team, everything. And I don't see why there would be a reason for him to say, no, let me see what happens in 24 and see if I want to manage again in 2025. Uh, because I think that what he expected was what all of us expected, and that was uh, more upgrades to, to this team. So I'm not surprised on the front office side because maybe they could have said, you know what, we want to see and, and, and wait and see what happens uh, with you before maybe negotiating in, in, for an extension. Got it. Um, what else do you guys believe that um, Skip most likely, or no, I should say, with the timing of this, do you believe maybe the timing of this was a little weird to go with the Marlins starting off 0 and 9 and they come in and the day that they won? Do you believe the timing could have been better, or do you think maybe this was pre planned to get it out now? I think the timing for sure could have been better, and it does spark a little. It is a little weird that it is after a long losing streak, but I think he still does have the full year. So depending on how this year goes, I think it's going to say a big part of it. If they keep going on one and nine every 10 games, I would say he might not be the coach here next year. But if they pick it up and start getting around 500, I think then it's a question of just how they do the rest of the year. And that'll take into a big part of if he's here next year. Yeah. Yep. Well, with that, let's go ahead and talk and go into today's game. We could do this very quickly. Then we get into prediction time. Let's look at the lineups for today's game against the Marlins and the New York Yankees. Again, mentioned it before, it's going to be a little Miami matchup there with Nesta Cortez going up against Jesus Luzardo. And, of course, we can always talk about the Marlins lineup. Let's go ahead and maybe look at the Yankees one. Nick, I know you're a big Yankees guy. You follow this team a lot. What have they been doing as of late, and who are, who are you looking at in this Yankees lineup? I mean, so one of the most surprising things right away is that one, they're eight and two, and Aaron Judge hasn't done much of anything so far. He has two home runs, but he has not been the guy really leading this team. It's been a lot of Anthony Volpe, Juan Soto, and I know he's not in the lineup today. Oswaldo Cabrera has also been a huge part of this Yankees lineup early mm -hmm. in the year. And Anthony Volpe, especially going into today, is very, very good against lefties. He batted 198 against righties last year, which was one of the worst in the majors versus lefties. He was significantly better. And this year he's hitting absurdly good against lefties this year with Volpe. And he's right now hitting 424. And a couple other guys in the lineup have been have had some clutch hits late in games. Alex Verdugo hasn't had a great start to the year, hit a huge extra innings home run the other day. And even our friend John Birdie had a huge had a go-ahead RBI and then a diving play at third a couple days versus Houston to help them secure a win. So this lineup is very deep. They have Jose Trevino catching today instead of Austin Wells. You'll probably see Wells the majority of the series, but Trevino going in today is more the defensive catcher. Not much offense coming from him, but and Giancarlo Stanton is always the threat to hit a home run. He's always a huge guy up there, had a grand slam the other day. He's a big threat at the top of the lineup, always going to hit for power, always going to be an aggressive guy. And you can't understand. I mentioned Soto like once, but it's, it's Juan Soto. You know what he's going to bring to the table. He's going to have great at-bats. He's going to always give you a tough at-bat, especially when there's Aaron Judge sitting behind him. Yeah, big lineup there. Um, Danny, looking at the, the Yankees as well, Glaber Torres, um, a, a lot of people there. Again, Aaron Judge hasn't really had the hottest start to the season, but mm -hmm. what have been your, your your thought of the Yankees, them starting 8-2? and two? I don't think a lot of people had them starting off this hot to start the year going back to last year. Yeah, especially because, I mean, they I mean they had – when you add Juan Soto to your lineup, you're 100% different, uh, probably – the, the, one of the best, if not the best hitter in the league, or at, at least the one with the with the better discipline. Um, I don't think people expected them to, as you mentioned, to be eight and, and, and two uh, at this point of the year, especially sweeping in Houston. Yeah. Uh, but this is a great team. This is a great lineup. I mean, it makes you think one through nine, uh, even when, when Jose Trevino is not uh, a great offensive threat. It's someone that, that makes you think uh, and, and makes pitchers go – through a thought process um, that you don't have against half of the, half of the catchers in, in this league. And we all know John Berry can hurt you with speed and, and whatever mm -hmm. thing he hits, he can reach first base safely because of how fast he runs. Um, 
but yeah, this is a very deep and tough lineup, of course. Um, even when Judge got off to a cold start, um, he is the most dangerous uh, hitter in the game. And and John Carlo, man, as, uh, as Nick mentioned, I mean, the Grand Slam yesterday, his homers just sound differently. And, and he's an offensive threat. And as I mentioned, um, that streak, man, uh, might end in this series. He hasn't homer against the Marlins yet. So uh, let, let's see let's see if that happens. Anthony Rizzo, another uh, uh, South Florida mm-hmm. guy, um, he, uh, he, I think he hit a homer yesterday as well. And, and the other day. obviously, yeah, the other day, I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, obviously, very tough lineup. I, I love that Nick mentioned Osvaldo Cabrera. Um, we probably can see him at some point during the game today, if they, uh, if the, when, whenever the Marlins bring a, a righty reliever, um, because he's looked better on the left side of the plate compared to the right side. But he can hit really well on on both sides. So um, got off to a really great start after a really awful spring training for Osvaldo. So yeah, looking forward to see what he can do in this series. Yeah, and I'm really excited. This is a good opportunity for the Marlins. You're you're coming off a game where you score 10 runs, and then you go into this ballpark, which is extremely hitter-friendly, as we all know. And, I mean, for someone like Josh Bell, who has an 805 OPS against the Yankees, it's a great opportunity for him to get it going again. I mean, this is a good opportunity for that bottom of the line with Avi Garcia, Manuel Rivera, Brujan, to see if they could get something going in this ballpark. You know, they have a good opportunity tonight, and, you know, I guess the bad part for the Marlins is that They've never seen Nestor before, if I recall. I mean, he's never faced the Marlins. So no. it should be it's gonna be a tough, tough opportunity for the Marlins at the same time. They've seen Stroman before. I'm not sure if they've seen Rodon before, but you know, th- this is again a, a lineup that has the chance to really get it going here in the Bronx. And I know the Yankees are really good, man. They're really, really good, but it, it's definitely it's definitely a closer matchup than what it may seem like. I mean, you know. You're bringing in someone like a Jake Berger or a Josh Bell into this type of a ballpark where they're going to really benefit from it, especially with the power aspect of things. And, and an Avi Garcia who could hopefully break out in this type of a series. I mean, they have a great opportunity here. But again, with Nestor, I mean, he's someone who who throws you off with his timing. Sometimes he's a really slow guy. Sometimes he's going to get it going right away. So the Marlins have a good opportunity here. But at the same time, I mean, it, it's not going to be easy, especially in that final game against Stroman. Yeah, and I think the one thing to keep in mind for Nestor this game is the Marlins are going to have to get things going early. Nestor's mm-hmm. given up seven runs this year. All of them have been in the first two innings. He's been really shaky in his first two starts at the start at the start of the game, first and second inning. But as the game's gone on, he's really locked in to every single game. So they're going to most likely have to jump on him early. And if they don't, they might be in for some trouble with this game against Nestor. Yeah, well... Um, we can really quickly look at the Marlins lineup again. No Jazz, Josh Bell, DH, Berger at first, Garcia, Manuel Rivera, Vidal, Brujan at center field. Uh, fellas, what, what do you make of this Marlins lineup? It, especially when you look at that, maybe the seven through nine there with Rivera, Brujan, Fortes might be a little bit of a struggle there. But what really stands out very quickly before we head to prediction time? Yes, Nate. Yeah, I mean, something that was nice yesterday, I wanted to mention earlier, was the bottom of the order. Um, bottom of the order had uh, six, seven, eight. They had seven hits combined. Um, different today, but uh, if you get Avi and Rivera and Brujan, at least get them on base, because, I mean, like like you said, it's been mostly Berger in the top of the order so far this year. But if you get those guys going, especially early against Nestor, get some guys moving around and get the top of the order driving back in, you could definitely set some things up, especially in Yankee Stadium. Yep. Yep. Perfect there. All right, let's get into prediction time. But first, I believe we have three special videos. Let me pick them up. It's not supposed to take this long. All right, here we go. Hey, guys, checking in from Yankee Stadium. My prediction for the series is Marlins take two or three. I'm being optimistic. And uh, Jake Berg is going to be the MVP. Live from Madrid, Spain, here are Yankee Marlins predictions. I think the Marlins actually take two out of three. And I think Jesus Luzardo is a series MVP. Bella? I think the Marlins lose two out of three, and the MVP is John Birdie. Oh, back to you, Kevin. <laughs> this is prediction time. Eli Sussman, Doug Sussman, about to take the train into Yankee Stadium for the series opener here. I have the Marlins winning two out of three, upsetting the Yankees, getting closer to a respectable record. Brian De La Cruz is my series MVP. Now your predictions, sir. 
The Yankees are on fire. Two out of three Yankees. MVP, former Marlin great Giancarlo Stanton. Back to you guys. Wow. I, I got to say, Mr. Doug Sussman with the earrings, picking the Yankees. I think he already is a FOF legend. I think Eli also was trying to call in Noah, um, taking the train and going with DLC as his MVP. But as always, let's start with Mr. Kevin Bacal. All righty. Well, let me set this up. I think we're good about this. Well, let's do that. All right. I will take the Marlins, two out of three. And I feel really good about Josh Bell going to New York overall. Good success. So Josh Bell is my series MVP. All right. Nick. I'm scared to say I think the Marlins going to unlock Aaron Judge, and he's going to be the MVP and lead the Yankees to win two out of three. All right. I go with myself. I'll make this very quickly. Um, I think the Yankees win two out of three. Again, I'm not going to be optimistic for the Marlins until they prove me wrong. Yankees two out of three. MVP, Giancarlo said. Nate. I'm feeling optimistic today also. Um, I'm, for my MVP, I'm going to go with Tim Anderson. As a history against the Yankees, had that homer, that field of dream game, and all those uh, Ben Stiller and Brawls a few years ago. But I think he's having a good series against the Yankees. If I'm wrong. All right. Last and certainly not least, the 27 time, just like the Yankees, Jeopardy champion Danny Alvarez. I hate it that Nate took it away from me because I wanted to do this. Remember that <laughs> that, that gesture from from Nick in the in the Philip Dream Philip Dreams game. Um, but I'm going two out of three of uh, the Marlins with Luis Arraes taking advantage of that short porch in right field, pulling the ball as a, a series MVP. All right. What a prediction time. We had Pop Up, we had From Madrid, and of course we had Us Five. And that's going to do it for us today on FOF Live, presented by Burger and Hicks. As always, go fish. <laughs>